So, let's talk about that dragon. I remember being really hyped for Ragnarok back in 2017. I had just entered the MCU fandom the previous summer, Thor and Loki were my favorite characters aside from the Maximoff twins, and I was genuinely hyped for this movie to come out. I think there's a needle on my floor. I saw every trailer like 50 times, so ready for another Thor masterpiece, which, um, yeah. So the previous two Thor movies are also trash, but Ragnarok is a special brand of trash. All of these movies are trash for different reasons. My feelings around Ragnarok have shifted a lot over the last few years. At first, I hated it with my entire soul. Later, I liked it begrudgingly. Now, I feel at most apathy with occasional joy. So I say this from both a place of love and frustration, but this movie, man, <laughs> this movie. Look, whether or not people are willing to acknowledge this generally, a lot of people are really, really unhappy with Ragnarok. Not just in a, this movie didn't vibe with me, glad you enjoyed though kind of way, and more so in a, I would burn every copy if I could and feel no regret kind of way. Tumblr especially is very vocal about how much it detests this movie, and no one is really willing to hear them out. This isn't just a hundred fans huddled in the basement reposting the same three posts around in circles. This is a lot of people for years that have been saying that this movie didn't do Thor and Loki justice, and they're angry and they're frustrated and they're extremely defensive. As someone who has spoken critically of Ragnarok in the past, I understand this on a personal level. Whenever you do discuss Ragnarok, even minor details in a negative light on the internet, people come with pitchforks and priests to unpossess you. It's kind of insane. Oh, you just don't like good movies is a very common response, or just don't stay in MCU anymore, and thousands of variations of responses that are, that are extremely dismissive, and in many cases, actually kind of emotionally abusive. Remember this movie wrong is my favorite, or you made up Loki's characterization and you're mad about it, left me in a state of distress for a week. Gaslighting is no bueno, even to strangers, okay? I promise we will get to the analysis in a second. I just want to make one thing clear. Criticizing this movie is not casting moral weight or judgment on it. Even if I'm going to discuss the massive area where Ragnarok failed, it doesn't mean that this is the worst movie of all time. It's just one of the worst sequels. Ragnarok is trash, but it's beloved trash, and I respect that. Having had many discussions about the Thor franchise in the past, one thing that I and a lot of fans have come to the conclusion of is that the Thor franchise reboot was a massive mistake for the characters. I understand why Marvel decided to take this route, Thor 1 and 2 were never really liked. Hating Thor 2 was a meme inside of the MCU fandom for a really long time, which is fair. Thor 2 is missing a significant part of the story, but that's for another time and another place. I love that movie, but I will admit that. Giving Thor a soft reboot was meant to appeal to a wider audience, because MCU had grown absolutely massive by 2016. Thor 2 was the worst performing movie in MCU until Eternal, so it's understandable why the writers felt like Thor 3 should go in a different direction. All of that said, this soft reboot is often and why so many people hate Ragnarok. And it's not just that fans hate comedy, Thor 1 and 2 are plenty funny, it's just that the Thor franchise, at its conception, was not intended to be a comedy. It's more like a Shakespearean fantasy, and people liked that, that was the appeal. The tone between Thor 2 and Ragnarok is physically jarring to watch. They don't match each other in the slightest, which was on purpose, but that doesn't make it any better. The difference between the two opening scenes of Ragnarok versus the Dark World really hammer home just how differently this story was going to be told. I don't know what you're thinking. Oh no, Thor's in a cage, how did this happen? Well, sometimes you have to get captured just to get a straight answer out of somebody. It's a long story, but basically I'm a bit of a hero. Long before the birth of light, there was darkness. And from that darkness came the Dark Elves. Millennia ago, the most ruthless of their kind, Malekith, sought to transform our universe back into one of eternal night. Told. Thor had shifted genres, and it had obviously shifted genres. Shifting genres is always a hit or miss, especially with long-term fans, but it is possible to pull off successfully while keeping the core attributes of the characters intact. Teen Wolf, 
famously pulled this off with their genre shift from season two to three. Season three, the one that declared that this was going to be horror now, is regarded as the best season in the entire series. And having seen this, yes, it is definitely the best season in the entire series by far. But there's one key detail between the genre shift of Teen Wolf and Ragnarok that I think a lot of people just dismiss. Only the genre shifted. Teen Wolf wasn't rebooted, the characters weren't changed. Teen Wolf kept the main cast consistent inside of the genre shift, which is what made it such a seamless transition. Ragnarok didn't do that. A lot of people enjoy the new versions of the characters, which is fine and I'm never going to complain about that, but what I do find so frustrating is the lack of acknowledgement that the characters have changed. Ragnarok does something that I lovingly refer to as gaslighting the narrative, where it pretends to have been this way the entire time and you, the viewer, are absolutely insane for seeing any difference. Obviously the characters have always acted like this, didn't you notice in the previous films? Clearly Loki has always been a massive narcissist, you just weren't paying enough attention last time. What this does, beyond leave a bad taste in the mouth, is make a lot of old fans really angry, and it's an extremely defensive anger. It never feels good to have people tell you you're wrong, but, but it feels almost insulting for the film, cast, director, and fans to say that you're in the wrong for noticing this change. I think we're all very aware of the fact there was a soft reboot in Ragnarok. I don't think we've really discussed what implications that had on the fans and the story. And again, if you like the rebooted versions of Thor and Loki, this isn't wrong or bad. There's always nuance. Ragnarok, Loki, and Thor have existed for five years now, and I would be gaslighting you if I didn't admit that they are their own characters from the loyal fanbase now. So a huge thing that I often see glossed over in praise for Ragnarok is how extremely dismissive Ragnarok is of the previous films. Anything it didn't like got thrown out or dropped entirely, and it, and it barely picked up the story where it left off. Shifting the genre to humor meant that you had to drop a lot of crucial details to Loki and Thor's story, because in all honesty, their story is dark. It is not funny. It wasn't supposed to be funny. Their story is about a family falling apart. How could you carry Thor's story about his emotionally abusive father, one who threw him out of their family for making a mistake and refused to let him come home until he proved himself worthy? A story about a man falling in love with a woman doomed to die and there's nothing you can do about it. A story about a brother who's lost his sibling and whose family is falling apart and he can't stop it. A grieving son, an abandoned child, a deserter of the throne. How could you carry any of this forward in a comedy? Ragnarok is meant to be fast-paced and funny. What moments of solidarity it does have are few and far in between and usually interrupted by a tone change. We can't take this seriously for five seconds. Or what about Loki's story? A kidnapped baby who was raised in a world filled with racism of his species. A cold, distant father who favored one son over another. Loki, whose internal racism was so intense that his mind broke in half at the idea that he might be Jotun. And he tried to die rather than live with this knowledge. Loki, who was sentenced to 4,000 years of solitude, who couldn't stop the death of his mother, who's trying to fix things with Thor but doesn't know how. Loki and Thor's story is not a comedy. It is impossible to tell their story with any real depth and meaning through a comedy. And Ragnarok understood that. It's why so many important plot points just get dropped. It's why, despite the movie trying to frame it as otherwise, Loki and Thor are both left with uncompleted arcs. Trying to shift the genre of the Thor franchise to comedy is like trying to shift the genre of the Avengers away from action-adventure to a rom-com. It feels really awkward to imagine the next Avengers movie without any of the action. Like, maybe it's only sharing the blueprint with the original Avengers movies. You'd have to do some creative character bending to fit the Avengers inside of a rom-com. I'm pretty sure 2017 MCU could probably have made it work and you'd enjoy the movie, but if you watch the Avengers movies in a row, the rom-com one would start to feel really disconnected from the others. That's what Ragnarok feels like to a lot of Thor and Loki fans. It broke the franchise, but because Ragnarok is such a good movie, no one wants to address that. I think it's really important to address just how much the genre affects the story. The tone of a story is one of the first things you're promised when you open a book. Within the first 10 pages, you know what the story's tone is going to be. It's subconscious, but it's there. If I handed you a book, didn't describe the story in any way, you'd still be able to tell me the tone and probably the genre. That's how this works. It's the same with a movie. First five minutes of Ragnarok? Yeah, this is a comedy. First five minutes of The Dark World? This story is not going to be funny. There is a massive difference between having a movie being a comedy versus just having funny things in a story. If you're going to sit here and tell people who don't like Ragnarok that they just don't enjoy humor, you've completely missed the point. Night at the Museum is one of my favorite comedic movies of all time, but it could have been done very differently. Night at the Museum could easily be a horror film. A guy being chased around by a museum all night by things determined to eat him with no escape or instructions on how to survive. 
horror. But it's not a horror because the narrative is very aware of itself. A dinosaur is going to chase him around. What if it was drinking water from a fountain first? He's about to get his head rammed with a train. What if the train was plastic and didn't actually burst his brains open? If you change the genre of Night at the Museum to horror, you are indisputably changing the DNA of the story. But that doesn't mean you change the characters. A reboot does. The most universally detested part of a reboot is not the fact that it might shift genres and make a story darker. It's when a writer takes beloved characters and changes them just enough that they feel off and persistently off. It's like a bug bite. The more you scratch, the worse it gets. Disney's recent live action addiction is a really easy example to look at because it's not the bad CGI that annoys us, it's the fact that it keeps changing the characters. Scuttle, for example, comes to mind. Ragnarok refuses to acknowledge that it did this to Thor and Loki, therefore it gaslights the Thor narrative. One of the most frustrating things about this film to me is that because a lot of the criticism previous Thor movies received for having Loki take up too much screen time and overtaking the plot, Ragnarok vastly overcorrected. Like, when you almost hit someone on a cliff and it's diving off the cliff kind of overcorrected. And it caused something that once you see it, you can't stop noticing it. No one can move any important plot pieces without Thor holding their hand the entire way. It drives me insane. Loki is a genius. Bruce is a genius. Val does not seem stupid, just drunk. Even Heimdall, who spends a lot of his time saving the Asgardians, ultimately doesn't do anything without Thor say so. Just let me give you some examples. So after Thor defeats Surtur in the first scene, he goes home and reveals Loki's Loki. Then because Thor is there, we learn where Odin is. Doctor Strange has to use one of Thor's hairs. Rather than Loki just casting a spell very similar to the one Doctor Strange used because Loki could have, because he's a master sorcerer. Then because Thor is there, we go to Doctor Strange which, why the heck is he leaving a calling card? This feels like a massive plot convenience and a little stupid. Why would you give your enemies your address? Who was this card for? So he goes to Doctor Strange, who gives him a tracking spell. They go to Odin, who only dies because Thor is next to him. Loki sends them back to Asgard, but, but only because Thor tries to throw Mjolnir at Hela. Hela decides to kill them, but only because Thor tries to kill her first. Loki is on Sakaar for weeks and does absolutely nothing in that time until Thor shows up. Thor bullies Hulk into becoming Bruce again. Korg's revolution suddenly works. Val has a sudden change of heart and wants to help Asgard. Heimdall gives Thor the vision that lets them know which portal they need to leave through. Thor is the one who realizes they need to have Surtur start Ragnarok and tells Loki to do that, and on and on and on it goes. No one can do anything without Thor giving them the idea, giving his approval, or him being there. No important plot pieces are moved without Thor seeming to give explicit permission for it to move. And all of this for what I believe was rather baseless criticism. In Thor 1, Loki and Thor aren't even on the same planet, but the moving parts of their story still affect each other. Loki tells Thor Odin is dead, so Thor realizes that his actions have consequences. Loki receives Regency of the Throne, and Sif and the Warriors 3 leave Asgard because of it. They, like, they don't exist in a void. Thor 2 is the same. Ragnarok Thor didn't need to stranglehold the plot so that way the story can move. He doesn't have have to do everything or give direction for someone else to do it. Because of Thor's need to stranglehold everything, it actually lacks a lot of the feelings of collaboration the other films brought. Rather than letting the characters bring something to the table and make independent decisions, it all has to be streamlined through Thor. Sif and the Warriors 3 taking off to Earth, for example, I'm done letting them. No one gave them permission to do that. Thor certainly didn't. Even Loki's betrayal of Thor, Thor has to give permission to happen. He pats Loki on the back to attach the disc here, and, and it's because that happened that Loki is allowed to betray him because Thor has a way to stop him. It's impossible to stop noticing this. And what this does is create massive weak links in the story and the characters because you start looking at people and you're like, why are you even here? Good side characters are side characters, not side objects. Even if Thor takes the center stage in this movie, he should be surrounded by a supporting cast. Scott McCall is the main character of Teen Wolf, but the supporting cast does things, often things Scott doesn't want. Ragnarok is very afraid to give its characters agency, and it really starts to stick out with retrospect. Speaking of those characters, as a heads up, yes, I am very aware that people like the new characterizations, but this is a video discussing what changed, especially with Bruce, Loki, and Thor. I have yet to find a way to do this in a neutral way, so I'm going to be very sarcastic and I'm sorry, but the characters have changed in a bad way, and if you want to talk about how they were improved, which in some cases, yes, they were, there are a billion posts and videos discussing that. We're here to talk about what went wrong. Heimdall, flawless performance, only competent character, would hire him to be king, Though he has a slight problem with committing treason, but maybe that would be a benefit for a king. One of the things that I will say about Heimdall is, is that he remains one of the flattest characters in the Thor franchise, and Ragnarok did not fix that. 
He has no personality and shows maybe two emotions total. As much as I admire this man and, and his consistent treason is iconic, I have no reason to care about him. This is how many things we know about Heimdall in the first Thor. And this is how many we know about him in Ragnarok. His lack of backstory creates a massive disconnect for the viewer. You aren't given any reason to care about him. He's literally just there to be an obstacle for the villain of that particular Thor movie, not a person. Hence, why when he dies in Infinity War, it's sad, but only because Thor cares about it, not that you do. How did Heimdall get his job? Why can he see everything everywhere all at once? How does he hear people? Why did he never say anything about Hela? Why does he have this job if he keeps committing treason? Does he have a family? What is his personal stake in these movies? Heimdall is so flat. He is a pancake you added too much milk to flat. And it annoys me beyond words. If he's this important in the movies, why didn't you give him something as basic as a personality, Marvel? It's not that hard. You had seven years with this man. Did no one ever question this? And I have a question for the writers of Ragnarok in general. Is Heimdall living in a cave below the observatory? Because there's nothing below the observatory. I thought that was kind of the point they were trying to make in the first film. I don't know. I have questions. You don't care, obviously. You killed him off in Infinity War for the gasp moment, of which he can suddenly use the Bifrost without the Bifrost, which is just indulge me in this side rant for a moment about MCU's lack of consistency. One of the things Thor 1 tried to emphasize is that magic is not this mystical thing beyond the realm of understanding. It's extremely advanced science. Thor explains this to Jane. It's a huge bonding point. We, the audience, don't understand it, but the Bifrost is clearly shown to be a machine, and this sword is the activation key, the big old red button, Asgard's personal teleportation device. And you know what was a huge point in Thor 2 and the Avengers? Asgard can't go anywhere with the Bifrost being broken. When Thor broke the Bifrost in the first film, he was essentially stranding his entire planet, and he knew that. There were massive consequences for breaking the Bifrost. So how, for the love of God, did Heimdall use the Bifrost, a scientific machine, to teleport Thor in Infinity War? That would be like me sending you a text with only the power of my mind. Okay, I'm good. I'm not. I'm really not. MCU seems to think that consistency will give it a rash. I know people will point out that it's had a ton of different directors and writers working on it, Yes, but Kevin Feige is heading MCU. It's his job to make sure that things are consistent. Valkyrie. Valkyrie is actually a fairly interesting concept of a character. Warrior of Asgard, the lone survivor of a massacre, runs away from Asgard in the aftermath and uses alcohol to cope with the fact that she's absolutely miserable. But Ragnarok had no interest in exploring this. She never has anything resembling an arc. It's just a to fight or not to fight. Valkyrie is not nearly as flat as Heimdall, but I feel like she deserved writers who actually care about her and see her as more than drunk who's vaguely funny and punches things. I want to know more about her character. How could she give up her morals and resort to slave trade? Was that something that she struggled with? Because she doesn't even seem inconvenienced that she's kidnapping people and giving them up in death matches. She's drinking, but we're told by the narrative that this has to do with Asgard and only Asgard. So, she has so much depth below the surface, but all her writers only seem interested in looking at that surface. And I'm annoyed, and not just for that, I'm also annoyed because her character serves exactly one purpose. She's how Thor and Loki learn about Hela without being on Asgard. That's it. She does exactly zero crucial things in the final battle. If she hadn't been there, the outcome would have been exactly the same. She is an exposition character hiding under the cloak of a cool character. And because she's gay, I guess we're all supposed to accept that as okay because representation. Even though they cut all her gay scenes and it's extremely easy to read her straight in this movie, I did first time around. I thought she was the love interest that replaced Jane. When you have to look up a character's sexuality on the internet after you see the movie, you did a bad job at representation. MCU was patting itself on, on the back for her being gay in 2017, even though, you know, this. Valkyrie in the comics is bisexual, but that means very little because MCU hasn't been comic accurate ever. At least Loki in the series had his throwaway line about being bisexual in canon. Valkyrie never did that. If she's supposed to be bi, maybe, I don't know, we could actually show her as bi. 
The point I was trying to make, she does not have a purpose in the story except to be who Thor and Loki talk to about Hela. Like, yes, the structure of the story falls apart without her there, which cements that she is an important character, but that doesn't mean that this information couldn't have been given by some other means. Any other scrapper could have taken Thor captive, they could have read books about Hela's existence or spoken to other Asgardians. Because we have to have the useless subplot of Sakaar, we needed someone to tell Thor and Loki what was going on. Thankfully, of all the places in the universe, the only survivor of a mass slaughter of the Valkyries retreated to Sakaar. I mean, what are the chances? Amazing! Almost like it's a teeny tiny bit of a plot convenience. I'm still mad. Hashtag give Valkyrie her own TV series. Actually, they do it badly. Um, let's take the entire team of Moon Knight, have them work on her series. She has so much potential that everyone is sitting on that. Give my girl some love. Speaking of characters that deserve well-written TV series, my chaos child, Hella. Okay, <laughs> confession time. If ever given the opportunity, you have no idea how quickly I would take the opportunity to direct this myself. It's my secret dream. I have the entire plot figured out, the negative arc, how it impacts Asgard, but only adds to the events of Thor 1. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Hella is one of my favorite characters, probably ever. Look, it's very, very rare that you come across complex female villains who are so clearly the victim in their own story. Like, Ragnarok is such a mess, but they are not completely cursed because they gave us her. That said, I still feel very conflicted about her character. On the one hand, like Valkyrie, Ragnarok did so much right when they set her up. She's extremely complex, but only when you dig very deep for the character underneath the mask of murderer. It's all about the subtext, baby. But Hela is dragged down by the one thing Thor and Loki didn't have to face with their original characterizations. The genre. What should be heavy emotional scenes are awkwardly interspaced with jokes. Every great king had an executioner. Not just to execute people, but also to execute their vision. But mainly to execute people. One day he decided to become a benevolent king foster peace, to protect life, to have you. I understand why you're angry and you are my sister and technically have a claim to the throne. And believe me, I would love for someone else to rule, but it can't be you. You're just the worst. Whoever you were, whatever you've done, surrender now or we will show you no mercy. Whoever I am, did you listen to a word I said? And this greatly impacts how seriously you take her story, because make no mistake, Hela's story is just as much of a tragedy as Loki and Thor's, but you don't realize that in Ragnarok. You're mostly just braced for the next joke. And as much as I love Hela, it's time to do a little trash talk. It's healthy. She's a horrible villain for Thor and Loki. She has exactly the same problem as Malekith did in Thor 2, but they covered it up this time by giving her a personality. Thor and Loki do not care about Hela, and Hela does not care about them. There is no emotional weight for any of their characters if they fight each other. One of the most memorable things about Thor 1 is the fact that Loki is the villain. It makes it personal. The best villains or antagonists antagonize the main character into growing. Hela doesn't do that to Thor. She reveals information about Odin to Thor and she forces Thor to take the throne of Asgard again, but she doesn't make Thor change. Even Loki in Thor 1 made Thor change. And Loki and Hela literally exchange two lines and throw weapons at each other and that's the extent of their interaction, so yeah. No growing there either. Killing Hela is only a problem for Thor and Loki because it's hard to kill her, not because it's emotionally difficult. If it had been, that would have caused a lot of growth and weight in the decision to kill Hela and the destruction of Asgard. Blowing up Asgard is an enormous sacrifice that they have to make, but the movie, at best, treats it like a minor annoyance, and we're supposed to laugh at it. Again. The damage is not too bad. As long as the foundations are still strong, we can rebuild this place. The f nah, those foundations are gone. Sorry. What did this do for Thor and Loki? Blowing up Asgard had no emotional impact on them. It didn't cause growth, it was literally just the solution to the plot. Whereas if you look at the ending of Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, Puss's fight with death actually changes him. Death has been antagonizing him the entire movie, forcing him to look at himself and making Puss realize things about himself and change. And he does. 
Puss learns to value his remaining life to the point that he doesn't feel the need to use the wish to restore his lives. He is a different person at the end of the movie than he was at the beginning. Hela is not like death. She doesn't force Thor to change at all. Malekith, for all his faults, did make Thor realize that he didn't want the throne. Hela made no lasting impact on him or Loki. She's just there. A plot bump for them to cross over and she truly deserved better. With all the work they did to develop her character, they should have done something with it. Bruce was handled very poorly in this film. The last thing we're shown he remembers is Natasha shoving him off the cliff and he asks Thor about Sokovia because he doesn't know. That's two years of his life completely gone. Hulk has fronted for a while before but nothing this long and although Bruce has a few scattered bits of discomfort for maybe two or three minutes and tries to argue with Thor by the end of the movie because it's inconvenient we forget about the fact that Bruce is terrified of Hulk. Terrified. His relationship with Hulk is better in Age of Ultron, but he still doesn't refer to Hulk as a person, just a code green, which means that he sees Hulk as this thing inside of him he can't escape. It's not a term of endearment, they are not friends. And Hulk took two years of his life. The implications of that would be horrifying. Will Hulk never let Bruce come back next time? Will Hulk kill more people? Because Hulk did kill a lot of people. The movie glosses over it, but Hulk was killing people for years straight. And Bruce is fine with that. His biggest concern this entire movie is whether or not he knows Valkyrie. Bruce should be having a panic attack. He should be showing something to showcase that this actually wasn't okay for him. From where Bruce was in Age of Ultron to him suddenly waking up totally okay with this in Ragnarok is almost unbelievable. And then Bruce jumps from the ship and dies on the Bifrost and this, again, I think was supposed to be funny. It just takes the weight out of this decision and the sacrifice Bruce just had to make. Bruce can't trust Hulk. He doesn't trust Hulk. And Ragnarok completely missed that. It's just easier to have Bruce and Hulk work together, but storytelling is rarely meant to be convenient. Bruce needed to continue his arc with Hulk and a huge part of that would have been addressing the fact that Hulk basically held him captive for two years. At the very least, Bruce didn't appear to consent to Hulk taking over, Hulk just did that. They needed to take Bruce's story seriously, Age of Ultron, for all its faults, did that. They acknowledged the fear Bruce feels and he was allowed to arc over those emotions, allowed to feel unsafe, Ragnarok, a comedy, apparently felt this would just be too much work so they dropped a crucial part of Bruce's story. And they did the same thing with Hulk. One thing that really annoys me about MCU is how little they seem to understand Hulk as a character. He is not a killing machine destined to go off like a nuclear bomb at will. Hulk is actually a character. He has likes and dislikes. He forms friendships with other characters in the Avengers. He and Spider-Man rather famously have a friendship. Ragnarok didn't get that. Hulk is an intelligent creature and Ragnarok decided he was going to act like a two-year-old. And I know this was based off the fact that it's been two years since Age of Ultron, but riddle me this. Loki said it had been three weeks when Thor had only been gone for a few days. That means, in all likelihood, Hulk has been in charge of the body for a lot longer than two years, at least a decade. And you're trying to tell me that Hulk is unbothered by the fact that he has to kill all these people? Hulk, who sees it as his one mission in life to protect Bruce from himself. Sure. I'm not an avid Hulk Bruce fan, but I know enough about their stories to feel immense disappointment and frustration with where Ragnarok took them. Endgame solidified the lack of understanding by having Bruce merge into Hulk's body again. Two separate entities, but Ragnarok is where it started. Okay, let's just be honest with ourselves. Loki is the most pointless, useless, stupid character in this entire movie. 99% of the story would have moved without him there, and that's a bad thing. In fact, it might have moved better. If you can remove a character from a story and the story flows just fine without them, remove the character or change the story. Heimdall, for all his flat pancake personality, actually helped move things in the story more than Loki did. The biggest problem with Loki is not the assassination of his character from the previous Thor movies, which is a thing we'll get to in a minute, but the fact that throughout this entire movie, Loki doesn't want anything. Like, honestly, tell me what Loki wants in this movie. He wants to be king of Sakaar. Why? He wants to save Asgard. Why? Why is he doing anything? He is there as a fan service, not because his contribution to the plot actually did anything. Like, tell me. Tell me something that couldn't have easily been done by the other characters that Loki actually did that was integral for the plot. Helping Thor escape Sakaar? Well, Korg could have done that. Rescue the Asgardians? Well, Korg could have done that. I would add more, but these are literally the only two things that Loki does in the entire movie that matter. 
Or Valkyrie could have helped Thor escape. He probably would have had way more passcodes than Loki ever did. Thor could have gone to Doctor Strange to find Odin, or I don't know, Heimdall, or Scourge, or someone who has the magical powers to see everything in the universe. He didn't have to go to Loki. Heimdall at least did have a purpose for what he was doing. He wanted to help the Asgardians. Loki doesn't even have that. And on top of that, Loki is just, oh my gosh, he is an idiot. Like one of the really appealing things about Loki as a character before Ragnarok is that he was smart. Really smart. Scary smart. The fact that he's smart is the reason the Avengers are afraid of him in the first Avengers film. He manipulates his way to the throne in Thor 1, although I still stand by the theory that most of the events in Thor 1 were a happy accident, which is why the movie is <laughs> bad. But Loki figured out how to travel between worlds, for God's sake, a power that is integral to the plot of Thor 2 and Thor 1. The fact that you can't guess what Loki is going to do in the first films because he's intelligent enough to keep pulling one on the characters and the audience was part of the appeal. Loki is not a trickster character in that he makes practical jokes and like drops buckets of water on people's heads and crap. He's a trickster in that he keeps tricking the characters and you. He's always two steps ahead. And then we get to Ragnarok and every decision Loki does this entire movie makes me feel like I'm losing IQ points. Loki is little screen time in this so I can point out every single stupid decision he made which is 95% of them. Starting with the play. What on earth was this stupid play? Like, whose decision was this? What was he thinking? People who write Loki and think that he has a massive ego do not understand the character, and the writers of this movie do not understand the character on any freaking level. Anyway, what's particularly stupid about this move is, like, what the heck is he doing? He's supposed to be running not one, not two, not three, but nine realms. Asgard is supposed to be protecting everyone. Isn't Loki supposed to be this political genius? In a deleted scene of Thor 1, Odin and Frigga talk about how worried they are Thor isn't ready to be king, but Frigga points out that he has his brother with him because Loki is the political genius. And is Loki doing anything? No, he's eating grapes and quoting lines like this is some sort of TV series he's seen a thousand times. Like what was this? Why did this happen? Loki is the only freaking character who knows about Thanos beside the Black Order at this point, and why isn't he preparing for that? Loki knew it was coming, that's why he had Sif take the ether to the Collector in the Dark World post credit scene. Is he not at all a little bit concerned about that? If not for selfless reasons like, I don't know, Asgard will die than selfish ones like Loki doesn't want to die? It would have been great foreshadowing, but no, he's eating grapes. Anyway, so then Thor shows up and Loki, who is a master manipulator, cannot hold his composure or act like their father in the slightest, which immediately tips Thor off, a con. Mind you that Loki has been successfully pulling off for four years at this point. Thor reveals that it's Loki and no one in Asgard is surprised by this, even though they were just watching a play about how he died? Then they go to Earth, where Loki put Odin in a senior citizen home after wiping his memory, but almost immediately upon coming to Earth, Doctor Strange drops Loki in a portal where he then just falls endlessly for 30 minutes. But you want to know the really, really silly thing here? Loki could have just taken a step away and the portal wouldn't have dropped him. Loki is a master sorcerer. In the first film, they call Loki a master of magic and he can't recognize the basic formation of a portal. In the Avengers, Loki figures out how to use the Tesseract to teleport someone when he was on a different planet. How does Loki not know what a portal from Earth looks like? He and Thor apparently know enough about Earth to pull off D.B. Cooper, which oh my gosh, do not get me started about stupid freaking D.B. Cooper. And he has no way to counteract that. He can't take a step to the left. He doesn't even try to use his own magic to counter that. What? Then they go to Norway, where Odin dies, and then Hela shows up, and Loki's response is to have them go back to Asgard by calling for a portal, which he knows Hela could jump into because he's an idiot. Hela has just broken Mjolnir, okay, I acknowledge that would be pretty scary, but he and Thor are trained, capable fighters who have fought people for hundreds and hundreds of years. The Dark Elves had those grenade things that made many black holes, and Loki and Thor still went head to head with them, despite the fact that all they had was Mjolnir, Loki's magic, a knife, and Thor's ability to be a punching bag. Again, Loki is supposed to be Master Sorcerer, and he doesn't even try to face off against Hela. As far as they're aware yet, they don't know that Hela can't really die. I would have found this sequence much more believable if they had just like a minute long fight where Hela absolutely brutalizes both Thor and Loki, beats them bloody, and then they go back to Asgard to recuperate, but that wouldn't have been funny, so.
Obviously, we can't do that. Then Loki gets hit with a knife because he can no longer cast magical shields like he could in the first Avengers to block bullets, and he's thrown out to Zakaar upon arrival. He immediately decides to take over the planet by seducing the Grandmaster, which, why? He is already king of Asgard. He likes Asgard, being king of Asgard was supposed to be something Loki wanted, right? His big goal. And then he gets to Sakaar and we need time to have passed, so Loki's just been there for three weeks to show that time is weird, and Loki's very bad at manipulating the Grandmaster, and just in general. Which, going to pause this because I recently had a discussion about how the Grandmaster was likely throwing unwelcome advances on Loki instead, and potentially forcing Loki to sleep with him, which is not great. Assault is still assault no matter the gender, and, and the fact that if this is the case, the movie frames it like it's funny is disgusting. So then Loki tries to talk with Thor, upon which Thor blames him for everything that's happened. Loki says they should defeat Hela because he cares about that now. He leaves, Thor goes missing, he talks with the Grandmaster, fights Val, and immediately loses because he couldn't think to move after the memory spell once Val fell over. Like, so then in the next shot, Loki's sitting on his crate in these chains. <laughs> <laughs> what? What are these chains? He could stand up and they would fall off of his body. What is going on? We're supposed to believe that Loki is there against his will and Val has captured him when he could have stood up and walked away. Okay, sure. If Loki truly wanted to stay on Sakaar like he says he does later, why didn't he stand up or like... I don't know, use some magic? Later, Loki betrays Thor again because he wants to stay on Sakaar even though he already gave access codes to let Thor get out, which- Sir, what are you doing? You just spent the entire movie trying to help Thor with everything and now you're trying to kill him because why? Have you ever met a motivation? Do you know what a motivation is? Have the writers ever looked at your story and thought about what it is that you want? Do you want anything in this movie? Are you okay? Do you need something? Do you need a hug? Why are you doing anything that you're doing? Can you tell me and give me one motivation? Don't you want to go back to Asgard? No, you don't want to go back to Asgard? Why do you want to stay on Sakaar if you hate the Grandmaster? I thought that you were helping the Revengers because you you wanted to get off of Sakaar because it's not safe for you on Sakaar anymore because the Grandmaster wants to kill you, but that doesn't matter anymore? Or did we really just want a scene where Thor finally outsmarted Loki by, you know, punishing him brutally? Was this necessary? Did we need this? No. Why is this here? Whose decision was this? I don't understand this move on the slightest. Did you know that in the junior novelization and in the original script that this didn't happen, which must mean that this is something that Takiya Watiti decided to change later, which really annoys me because it doesn't make sense and it also breaks the motivation and sabotage is everything that Loki's been trying to do the entire movie and I don't understand anything. So Thor leaves him on the floor in a movie showcases just absolute sadism. We'll get to that later. And then Loki sits up and just immediately commandeers the escaped slaves. And then he gets to Asgard with this tiny boat. Side note, Asgard in the Loki series is shown to have a population of about 10,000 and this is maybe like 100? Where did all the people go? Thor tells Loki to start Ragnarok and Loki does, blowing up their planet because it is apparently that hard to talk to Hela, even though he would probably be the only character that actually could break through to her. I just can't with these people. I can't. Loki is such a massive idiot in this film. Like, his decisions are framed as really clever. Or like they should make sense and you're just a fool for having missed it, but you're not. Because Loki has no motivation in this film, every move he makes comes off as stupid or contradicting the last move he made. He has no goals, no wants, no purpose. The only reason we care about what this character does is because of the backstory we have, but that doesn't make the bad writing go away. In the first Thor, the Avengers, and the Dark World, even if Loki's character wasn't written very well, by that I mean consistently, he at least had a goal. Asgard, Earth, getting revenge for Frigga. But he doesn't have that in Ragnarok because of how much his character changed. A good chunk of the Loki fans I've spoken to absolutely loathe Loki and Ragnarok. You can find endless posts on Tumblr discussing why Ragnarok did him dirty, how his character has changed, down to angry rants about costume choices and why he sucks now, and also frustrations with how Thor treats Loki in this film. I agree with a large portion of these, but the main problem with Loki beyond the lack of motivation is this. I trust you. You betray me round and round in circles we go. See, Loki, life is about, it's about growth, it's about change, but you seem to just want to stay the same. You know why this is here? Because the writers were sleeping on Loki's previous appearances. The writers did not know what to do with Loki in this movie. Loki is one massive, uncompleted character arc. The Dark World feels like half of one story, but at least it's a story. The director, Ragnarok, admitted many times that he didn't like Loki. He thought Loki was a crybaby orphan, which is 
severely undermining a character who had such rich depth in the previous films, especially the first one. I think any time a director picks a specific character to scapegoat the entire film, that's a very bad sign. Even if you don't like Loki, understanding him is crucial to writing him correctly. They flatline Loki in this film by stating that A, his character arc was already completed, he became an a-hole and that's as far as we're going, and B, they weren't willing to let Loki be an important part of the story. The director was so tired of Loki fans actually liking the character that he wanted to make sure that Thor was the only character in this movie that could do something. Loki and Thor's uncompleted arcs are something I'll get to in a bit, but Loki's lack of motivation leads me to Thor. When you go into spaces that discuss why Ragnarok was a horrible movie, you'll usually only find fans discuss why they didn't like what happened with Loki and how Thor sucks now, which is fair. You just think that it's a Loki fan thing. But girl, it's not a Loki fan thing. Old Thor fans are angry too and absolutely done with this narrative. For all my problems with Loki, compared to what they did to Thor, Loki got a team of devoted writers who wanted the best for him and understood him at a fundamental level and really, really wanted to make sure his story was told in a proper way. Thor was absolutely dragged backwards and forwards to this movie in horrible ways that completely destroyed him at his core and I hate it. The biggest problem with Thor in this film is that he is now the biggest, most unapologetic a-hole in MCU, but because he makes jokes it's completely glossed over. He is so unlikable, they took everything that Thor learned in the previous film and just shoved him backwards so he got reset at Thor 1. I was totally fine with it because he's funny now so it's okay guys I checked. Like. Genuinely take away the jokes and what is he? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. No, just an a-hole. That's his thing, this movie. And he, like his brother, is missing any sort of arc or development. So let's just go over this extensively. Thor is an extremely frustrating character to me in this movie because he lacks the one thing that made Thor who he is since the first film. Compassion and empathy. For all of Thor's faults in the first film, these have always been a huge part of his character. Thor cares. Thor cares deeply about everything. A perfect example of this is when Loki is hanging over the edge of the bridge and he begs for Thor's help. Yes, it was an illusion, but Thor didn't know that. In that moment, he thought it was his sibling. And what does he decide to do? He reaches out to help Loki. After all that Loki has done to Thor in this movie, all the lies and deception, Thor still chose to save him. It's this compassion that makes you scream, that's my boy at the top of your lungs. Thor's empathy is another huge part of his character in MCU. He tries to understand Loki, even though Loki was rapidly descending into a psychotic break. And Thor is able to rapidly adjust to different cultures like Earth because of his empathy. And Ragnarok just completely discarded both of these things. Because make no mistake, Thor treats everyone absolutely horrible in this movie. Valkyrie, Thor keeps going on solely so that way he can get her to do what he wants. He has no compassion for her struggles in the slightest. Her alcoholism is a joke to him at best and a massive inconvenience at worst. Solely because she's Asgardian, he thinks that she owes Asgard something. He's constantly trying to butter up to her, but he doesn't even like her. The constant bullying is meant to encourage us that they're getting closer, but that's not what this is doing. All it's doing is showing a cycle of emotional manipulation that's definitely not encouraging. Even a single line of, I understand that you're struggling, but I really need your help, would have done wonders for helping change this cycle. But there wasn't even that. And Thor is not incapable of this. In the Dark World, he recognizes others' feelings multiple times. The scene where he asks the warriors three to commit treason comes to mind because Thor makes sure that they understand what they're doing before asking them to help him. He asks. He doesn't bully. He doesn't emotionally manipulate. He asks. He acknowledges that this isn't a comfortable position for them to be in and that he will understand if they don't want to help him. In that scene, he shows eons of emotional maturity that Ragnarok Thor can only dream of. Hela, Thor doesn't even try to reach out to. That's Thor's thing. He tries to argue with villains to understand them, to try and convince them to stop. There wasn't that. Hela was an inconvenience to him. And he goaded her. Hela talks with people all the time before fighting them. She doesn't immediately fight him, showcasing that she is interested in discussing this. Thor just doesn't want to, so he doesn't. Compassion goes out the window. No empathy, nothing. Just cold indifference. Hela tries to explain about how painful it was to be replaced by Thor, and rather than reach out to her, Thor mocks it by saying that Odin cast him out too and he's fine. And that's when Hela gives up on him. If, in that moment, he had tried to reach back, who knows how this battle would have ended. Thor in the Dark World absolutely could have talked Hela out of fighting because she didn't want to fight him in the first place. And it only gets worse with Bruce and Hulk. Thor and Bruce aren't friends. Neither are Thor 
Thor and Hulk. Thor spends the entire movie assuring one or the other that he likes them more to reach the other. Bruce even flat out says that you're just using me to get to the Hulk, and Thor immediately denies it, even though it's true. You don't care about me. You're not my friend. No, I don't even like the Hulk. He's all really? like, I smash, smash. I, I prefer you. If I'm being honest, when it comes to fighting evil beings, he is very powerful and useful. Yeah, Banner's powerful and useful too. Is he though? Okay. Thor is emotionally manipulating Hulk and Bruce, and it's extremely disgusting to watch. Like this, Thor lies to Hulk about Earth with information he doesn't have to emotionally manipulate Hulk into doing what he wants. This is on purpose. This isn't an accident. Thor knows what he's doing, and he's doing it anyway. Bruce and Hulk's feelings are an annoying thing to overcome to him, not something to take into consideration. And he does this the entire movie. Honestly, it's little wonder Bruce didn't want to help him. I wouldn't either. I didn't know much about emotional abuse when I saw this movie for the first time, but even as a teenager, their interactions made me deeply uncomfortable. I hated any screen time they got together because how badly Thor was treating Bruce. It felt unnecessarily cruel. And it was. And then we get to Loki. Thor forces Loki to out himself in front of the public as Odin rather than pulling him aside for a private conversation as a form of punishment for Loki not telling him he was alive. He never asks why Loki didn't tell him he was dead again, just accuses him of being inconsiderate because grieving Loki was a burden to Thor. Any protective instinct Thor felt for Loki is dead. There's no way you could convince me that Avengers 1 Thor would let Doctor Strange drop Loki for 30 minutes and just be completely fine with it. And then we get to the elevator scene. I know a lot of people talk about their conversation and how it showcases just how much Loki and Thor don't understand each other, because they clearly don't, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about Get Help. Loki clearly says several times that he doesn't want to do Get Help in several ways and Thor ignores it and dismisses him. There is not a shred of understanding or even basic compassion. Loki is the one under threat of bodily harm with this move. Those guards were holding weapons. Loki easily could have been impelled or at least badly injured. And Thor decides to do this anyway, even though there were several easier ways it could have gone about this. Loki can summon knives. There is no reason for them to do get help, especially when Loki has not given consent for Thor to do this. It becomes a lot less funny when you realize that. Get help. What? Get help. No. Come on, you love it. I hate it. It's great. It works every time. It's humiliating. Do you have a better plan? No. We're doing it. We are not doing get help. Get help! Later in the same scene, this is where Thor was completely destroyed to me. You know that scene in Thor 1 where Thor chose to show Loki compassion even after everything he's done in the movie because Thor's compassion is what made him a hero? Yeah. That's gone now. Instead, Thor leaves Loki on the floor with a torture device in his neck for who knows how long. Thor is aware that the Grand Master is looking for them. He has no idea what will happen to Loki if he leaves him there. All things considered, Thor is lucky that Loki wasn't taken into custody or killed by the Grand Master. All of that aside, leaving him on the floor in pain so intense he can't move or speak is unspeakably cruel, even if it is Loki. I've seen many people argue justifications for this move. Oh, Thor's just giving Loki a piece of his own medicine. It was funny and justified. It's about time Thor tricked Loki. But that does not excuse how unspeakably cruel this is. For all their issues, Loki at least has one thing over Thor. He has never left him with a torture device on and walked away. Loki stabbed Thor, but Thor was still able to walk around afterwards and they were fighting. It was nothing like this. The lack of compassion is legitimately disturbing. Look, I have some family issues, but I can't imagine leaving one of my siblings on the floor in unspeakable agony as I walk away, knowing that I could stop it at any time and that I just didn't care to help. This Thor is not the same Thor on the Bifrost. We are going backwards here. And then, for some reason, Thor has the gall to accuse Loki of being late rather than any sort of apology. Are you kidding me? After all that you did to him, how did you see this outcome going? What were you thinking? You are so freaking lucky that no one found Loki before Korg did. Unspeakably lucky. The narrative is favoring you lucky. All of these interactions with the sidecast drive home one point. Thor is horrible to the people around him, and this film frames it as being completely okay, if not outright encouraged. You're supposed to root for Thor torturing his sibling because it's a justice for all that Loki has done to him. But that's the thing though, isn't it? Heroes, as Thor keeps insisting he is in this movie, don't retaliate. They don't take revenge, not the good ones. And Thor was a good hero. 
I don't think I can emphasize this enough. Thor's compassion is what made him a complex, wonderful character to watch, because buried underneath the masculine exterior was a puppy with a heart of gold, and Ragnarok didn't use that. Yes, there are scenes where Thor is more gentle with the characters, but when there are so many scenes like the ones above where Thor is horrible to everyone around him but the film justifies it, you really start to realize how horrible Thor is in this. But that's the thing. The movie won't acknowledge this. It gaslights the narrative again. Oh, Thor has always been like this. Thor never treated his friends with compassion. Thor has always emotionally manipulated people into getting what he wants. He never tries to reach out for understanding. He's never once learned a lesson about how bad it is to take revenge. I hate what they did to Thor. I hate it. I know that fans can take all this horrible stuff and did and wrap headcanons around it and turn it into something a lot better and that's fine. I really appreciate that because it makes him much more bearable, but in canon, with what we're shown, with no explanation by fans, Thor is not a good person. He is the ex that you would tell stories about until you died, the one that leaves you emotionally scarred for life. He is the embodiment of toxic masculinity, but because he throws around some funny lines, we're all okay with this? Everyone says that Ragnarok Thor drinks his respected woman juice, but bestie, where? Treating Valkyrie and Hela like crap is not respect woman juice, dismissing their feelings making them feel worse for talking to him, and getting angry they're not prioritizing his needs and wants, that is not respect woman juice. You know what was respect woman juice? Yes. And who proved wrong all who scoffed at the idea that a young maiden could be one of the fiercest warriors this realm has ever known? I did. True, but I supported you. No obligations, no demands, Thor just supported Sif in her journey to become a elite warrior in Asgard because he could. In a society that favors men, he chose Sif. He respected her desires and encouraged her and supported her. That is respect woman juice. This is not. I could trash talk him for hours, but we have other ground to cover. Thor Ragnarok did not complete the Thor trilogy, at least not in a way that feels satisfying. The genre shift left many things unsaid, but with the context of the previous films, it is not a good emotional journey. It doesn't serve the characters, it only serves the plot. What has Thor learned or gained between Thor 1 and Thor 3 that he didn't have at the beginning of Thor 1? The main problem for Thor in the first film was his arrogance and impulsiveness kept getting him into trouble, and Ragnarok kept this going, he's impulsive and arrogant and selfish, again. It's ridiculous, because the disregard of his brother is what the set the first film going. And that aside, Odin's lack of love to Thor, his lack of love to Loki, Frigga's failings to reach out to both of them, Thor 1 is a story about a broken family, Thor 2 picks up that journey where it left off, but Thor 3 tries to ignore it altogether by glossing over what was the most appealing part of the Thor movies, Thor and Loki's messy relationship. Thor did not grow in Ragnarok, what fault did he overcome, what new chapter to his story did we unveil that made us think about Thor in a new way? There was nothing for him to overcome, no character flaw the narrative acknowledged, and Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, Puss's disregard for his life is the character flaw that he has to overcome. Thor's is... and Loki's is equally blank. Ragnarok didn't stretch Thor. Ragnarok wouldn't know an arc if it hit it in the face. For as good as the plot is and as fun and entertaining, it is not a good sequel. I've thought extensively over the last few years about ways this problem could have been fixed, and here's one solution that I thought of that could keep the core attributes of this film, but made it more focused on Thor and Loki. A, we're throwing out the comedy and buddy genres. As I've talked about at length, they do not fit the Thor trilogy. It's dark again. B, keep Hela, keep Ragnarok, keep the destruction of Milnir. We're changing the stakes. Thor and Loki are fighting for each other, not Asgard, not Sakaar, not some arbitrary thing with stupid betrayals that didn't make sense because, to me, in my own personal opinion, the huge thing that Ragnarok circled around but never actually fixed was this. In Thor 1, Thor needed to choose Asgard, and Loki prioritize his kingdom and throw his arrogance to put them first. His selfishness is what puts Asgard in danger, and Thor's selfishness slash arrogance is ultimately what blinded him to Loki's pain and led to the massive fallout later. In Thor 2, Thor did the exact same thing, but it was under the guise of wanting to be a good person, which my frustrations with that are for another time. In Thor 1, Loki needed Asgard to choose him, and he needed to choose Thor. He needed to know that he was accepted even though he's Jotun, and Loki needed to choose Thor first, to recognize that their bond goes beyond blood. In the Dark World, Loki helped Thor with Jane, he was stabbed for Thor, and he let Thor go because he knew the throne would make Thor unhappy. They needed to talk, and they didn't. Loki is midway through his arc with Thor. I'm just the on the throne situation. 
Loki did not need to give Thor a pep talk to make him feel better. That was a decision he did. That was the best bit of parenting Thor's ever received and it was from Loki, so do with that what you will. An acknowledgement from the Dark World on why Thor doesn't want the throne was really good. It helped develop Thor as a person and gave complexity to the crown that Thor didn't have before. Thor was deeply traumatized by the events of Thor 1 and the throne to him is equal to becoming his dad. And after the Dark World and all that Odin was willing to sacrifice in the first movie and how it seemed to send Loki spiraling, Thor realized he didn't really want that. Thor needed to realize that he can be a good man and a good king, and they never reached that point. If you're going to make a point about Thor rejecting the throne, you need to start his arc off with that. You need to acknowledge that it happened, and then have Thor choose it the next time. Thor has a second coronation where he's not trying to goad the crowd in the Statesman, but we didn't earn that. We didn't earn any of that in Ragnarok. Not Thor and Loki's repaired relationship, not the coronation, not Thor's development, nothing. So on Ragnarok, instead, Hela takes Loki captive because he's king and has information and slash or power she needs and she banishes Thor to Sakaar. Thor is given the opportunity to stay in Sakaar and live out his life peacefully as the good man he's always wanted to be. And since the crown has been this looming thing that has felt like promised corruption, he takes it. Eventually, Thor meets with Val and then Bruce and rather than Thor manipulating his way into getting them to work with him, Val and Bruce are trying to drag him off his butt. Tweak Val's story of fraction, she was banished from Asgard after her failure and she wants nothing more than to go back and thinks that getting Thor home will make the Asgardians love her again because maybe she has this whole thing with like needing to be hero worshipped because it's the only way that she feels a sense of community after she lost the Valkyries and she's been feeling that hole with alcohol ever since. Bruce, because he's Thor's friend, wants to help him once he hears what happened. Like. That's it. He doesn't need any more motivation to be helping Thor. He just wants to help Thor because they're friends. After some realizations about Odin, Thor realizes that he needs to put Asgard first. He swore to cast off all selfish ambition, and staying on Sakaar and hiding from the problem? Well, that's pretty selfish. Thor can be a good person and a good man. Maybe Thor thinks Loki made a deal with Hela, or maybe Loki actually did make a deal with Hela, I'm not sure. Point is, Thor thinks Loki's fine because I'm pretty sure Thor wouldn't be able to go through this emotional journey if he's freaked out about Loki the entire time. On Asgard, Loki is not fine. Hela's making a mess of everything and trying to destroy Odin's legacy like he did hers. Or, Hela was forgotten by everyone on Asgard. I think a much more interesting way to take her character is to A, have Odin be wrong about her ambitions. Like, she doesn't care about trying to conquer the Nine Realms. She is only this big old scar in Odin's legacy and he had to get rid of her in order to make himself seem more benevolent. So if Odin is wrong and we put Hela in the right, then that means that there's just like endless layers of complexity to the Asgard situation. Hela was forgotten by everyone on Asgard, so I think a much more interesting way to take her character is to have Hela spend the entire movie trying to break the spell that Odin cast on the Asgardians so people will remember her, often to extreme harmful lengths because Hela is lonely, desperately lonely. And in the midst of this, Loki puts his neck on the line to keep people safe. He uses his manipulation skills to con her, works with Heimdall, and is working on a plan to rescue Thor because he doesn't know where Thor is and if Thor is safe. Heimdall and Loki discuss this at length and Heimdall says that he knew Loki was Jodin and that it's okay. Loki's heritage is revealed to Asgard, not through a play, but by some other means, and Asgard still chooses to trust him anyway. That would go millions of years into helping Loki feel better about everything. Thor comes back to Asgard with the knowledge about Ragnarok, and he and Loki reunite. Both of them realize that they've grown up since the first film. Loki put Thor first. Thor is putting Asgard first. Ultimately, having accepted themselves for who they are, the kid who does not want to be their father and the kid who does not want to be a monster, Loki and Thor can now accept each other. Because Thor and Loki already love each other, we know that, we've seen it. We know that their relationship can be repaired and fixed and that they let the universe burn to keep each other safe. What we don't know is if they can meet each other since they've changed and grown, and Thor 3 had the opportunity to do that. Thor 1 broke their relationship, Thor 2 started to mend it, Thor 3 should have healed it. I don't think they should kill Hela, and this is not just because she's my baby child, but it's partially because she's my baby child, but mostly because Thor and Hela are mirror characters of each other. And I think Thor showing her mercy would be a better character growth than him immediately trying to kill her. If Thor can help Hela change, then he knows he can change too. 
There shouldn't have been this big fight on the Bifrost again. Ultimately, it should have been something more verbal. Maybe they fight in the throne room, but with words. Communication isn't their family's forte? Okay, great. But then fix that. Let them communicate, scream at each other. But in the end, let Thor's compassion be the deciding factor because Thor from the first film will always choose to try and rescue a fallen sibling, not shove them off the edge. Thor, Hela, and Loki will never be able to grow until they accept the damage Odin did to them. So the final fight should have been about that. With the shadow of Odin's legacy hanging over all three of them, they should have turned their back on Odin by choosing each other over some stupid seat of power that Odin has been making them fight for since conception. Because Hela, while trying to fix Odin's memory spell, has unfortunately gotten attached to Loki and at her core, Hela in Ragnarok canon craves connection. Give her that with Thor and Loki when they talk about Odin. Loki, at his canon core, wants to be accepted for who he is. Give him that with the public acceptance of his Jotun heritage, where his silver tongue is able to save them, his magic. Let Loki use his powers for good and remind him that at his core, he is a good person. Thor, at his core, wants to be worthy of love. Show him that he doesn't have to earn it. That it's already there. Let Val and Bruce take care of him. Let Loki choose him over and over again. Destroy Mjolnir and then show Thor that he is worthy anyway. Let him throw off the legacy of his abusive father, armed with the knowledge that he is worthy of his family's love anyway. And along the way, Bruce learns to be less afraid of Hulk because Val and Thor do not care and Val realizes that the community she's been looking for doesn't have to be this big group that hero worships her, but it can be something small like Bruce and Thor. Ragnarok, I think, at its core, should have been about loneliness. That's the direction the first two films sent this trilogy spinning toward. They were clearly doing a narrative framing to showcase isolation. Learning to find community would have served the characters a lot better than this. So it is not in my nature to specifically point at people and blame them for things that went wrong, especially on a film slash TV setting because there are a lot of people involved in these things and blaming one person is usually unproductive and spurs on hatred that doesn't really serve much. But Ragnarok is a special case because Watiti was in charge of everything and often just ignored the script to do what felt funniest that day, so most of these problems are definitely his fault. However, and this is a very, very big however, this does not mean that the way Takiya Watiti has been criticized has been completely justified. A lot of the criticism around Watiti is neutral or just discusses his work, but in some cases it has devolved into racist rhetoric, which is stupid. People are a lot more accepting of mediocre MCU movies if they were directed by white people, which is extremely frustrating because race really shouldn't factor into any of this. Writers of any race can be good or bad because writing is completely race neutral. A lot of this may not be conscious, but I would deeply regret if I didn't bring this up. While this next section will discuss his writing in a negative way, this is not an excuse for anyone to be racist about him in the comments. I don't care about Takiyo Watiti as a person. I care about his writing and that's it. I care that he was painfully ignorant of mental health struggles and that's about the only place I'm going to criticize him as a person, but I would do this with everyone because we should know better by now in the year of our lord 2023. I personally think it is very funny that he lied to get the job to begin with because you'd like, yeah, same. Also him just saying yes to everything is the funniest running joke to me. Like I was surprised at first, but it is a competitive industry so it makes sense. But to be clear, yes, I have my frustrations with his directing, but please don't harass him personally. He is just a guy, okay? Okay. I've debated a lot about whether or not to even include this section, but I feel like it's really important to talk about him to understand why Ragnarok happened and the specific place that it goes from failing to outright harmful and insulting because Takiya is the reason that that happened. So firstly, yes, Watiti lied to Marvel to get the job, which as I said, I find really, really funny. Mostly because he apparently just said yes to everything, which once I read this, all I could think about was this, which is a joke that 0.003% of you will probably recognize. Just say yes whenever anybody's got a question. Just say yes, don't settle for nothing less. Yes is a secret to success. You don't have to be the best. Just say yes. So that's it? That's right. Uh, let me get this straight. I just say yes. Uh-huh. 
but what if the answer really isn't yes? Well, that's a good question. See, we got a lot of clever guys around who can flip a question upside down, so the answer will always be yes. As I said, once I heard that, I could not stop thinking about this. So you're welcome, because now it will be stuck in your head for the next 10 years. Second, Watiti had no interest in writing a sequel to the first two Thor films and was apparently encouraged by Marvel behind the scenes to make massive changes. Changes, not a retcon. So anything he did was fine and MCU was okay with it, even if it apparently caused a lot of problems with, with the opening of Infinity War and, and assassinated the characters, which is not what Marvel wanted. They wanted Watiti to write a sequel. They wanted him to change things, but they wanted him to write a sequel. But Marvel actually wasn't okay with what Watiti did because the Russo brothers spend all of Infinity War undoing what Watiti did to Thor on purpose because Marvel didn't like it. Thor gets back the weapon, he gets back his eye, he's emotional and a mess, and he makes zero jokes in the entirety of Infinity War because Marvel wasn't okay with what happened. They retconned the retcon. Kevin Feige has to sign off on all of this, okay? He approved Ragnarok, decided he didn't like that, and then said it was okay if the Russo brothers changed all of it? Pick one, Kevin. It's not that hard. On Tumblr, in the depths of despair and the anti-Ragnarok tag, you come across a lot of hatred for Watiti. Tumblr is good at two things, bad posts and lying. So I always just brush this off as overdramatic fans blaming Watiti for everything they didn't like. Then I started doing research and reading interviews and watching interviews. And yeah, this one time Tumblr was a thousand percent right and Watiti did deserve all of the frustration. You look at all of the interviews Watiti did for Ragnarok and you read the things that he's saying and you really start to realize that this man has absolutely no respect for the source material and I mean that genuinely. Here's him complaining about the comics. Here's the thing about me guys, I did not really do my research. I read one issue of Thor as my research, not even a graphic novel, one of the thin, thin ones, and by the end of it I was like, well we're not doing that. Let's not look at those anymore. Cool art, I love the art, but I can't stand the way everyone talks. Here's him complaining about the movies. The entire film is what it was. The destruction of Thor 1 and 2 was everything you felt like you knew from those films and the rec recreation of this thing, which I feel stands alone by itself even though watching the first two films gives you some cool little things to reference. But I do feel like, for me at least, it's a new Thor 1. Well buddy, it's not just you. And also, you were hired to write a sequel to the first two films. That was your job, that was what you signed off to do and you decided to make a new one. You're just starting the trilogy over. I really just want to break this down in detail. If you don't care about the comics and you haven't enjoyed the previous Thor movies, then you definitely thought this character assassination was fun and you probably enjoyed Thor 3. It's hard to not like Ragnarok as a singular movie sitting on its lonesome. But Ragnarok is not a movie sitting on its lonesome. Watiti did exactly the same thing that bad book to movie adaptions do, they forget the heart of the story. And the heart of the story was not about a space prince running around trying to stop a burglary, it was about Thor and Loki falling apart and trying to fix that. Yes, Watiti described the plot of Ragnarok as being a burglary in this interview. So, you know, when you, really when you look at the story, it's just about a guy trying to get home because there's a burglar in his house. This is really like after hours um, set in space, you know, he's like accompanied by his annoying brother and a drunk chick and this bipolar guy who's prone to temper tantrums. Hella was trying to kill people. How was that a burglary? I have never seen someone so proud to flaunt how much they hate the source material for something and being so praised by the audience for ignoring it. People practically heralded him as a directing god because he didn't bother to understand what made the audience like Thor in the first place. Because Thor did have an audience, it's not like it was Morbius where everyone hated it and it got memed back to life because it was so bad. The audience for the Thor movies may have been smaller, but it wasn't no one. People liked these films, they had a reason to like these films. And the most frustrating thing is that he spends the entire movie making fun of old fans for enjoying the film. 
This scene with these weeping girls gathered around a fake Loki is clearly a mockery of Loki fans. This entire scene with the play is mockery of Thor 2 and anything good that came from it. Here is Watiti mocking Loki's backstory and the fact that he was kidnapped. Watiti has no regard or respect for what made the first films despite their many, many, many flaws work, and it shows in every single scene in this movie. He does not care about Thor, he does not care about Loki, he cares about making you laugh. Not about telling a good story, he just wants everything to be funny. It always has to be one long, dragged out joke, and I cannot stand it. Films, these, these blockbusters, the jokes that you hear were written about a year before they started shooting, you know, in a, in a, in a boardroom with, you know, a couple of dudes all patting each other on the back for coming up with a quip. I use the script as a suggestion. So when we turn up to set, it's like, how do we make this funnier and how do we drag the joke on and keep it going? And, you know, why don't we, like, make fun of how boring these moments are in yeah, these films? If there's the Ireland or British or, you know, or, or Australian flavour to it, um, humour-wise, the jokes do go on and they go on to the point beyond when they're funny. What he does not like Asgard. He wanted people to laugh at the destruction of Asgard because he hated it so much. He hates Hulk slash Bruce and thought that he was a one-dimensional bipolar idiot who clearly had no depth, which shows a clear lack of understanding about what bipolar is as a mental illness and a lack of understanding about what made Hulk an interesting character in the first place. I just find it so funny that Watiti hated the source material so much that he couldn't even stand the setting. It would be like trying to direct the Hunger Games and hating the district, so you decide to put the tributes in Middle Earth instead, and then you keep claiming that it's the same setting even though it's not anymore. I think that Watiti added a lot of depth to Asgard, that is really fun. I love the idea of Asgard being like England. Like, I really love that aspect. I loved that Watiti decided to just spill all of the tea on Asgard, and I think that it worked really, really well inside of this film. What I don't understand is how he improved Asgard, like, significantly and gave it a lot of layers and depth, and still hated it to the point that he wanted people to laugh at its destruction. Like, he just spent so much time putting so much effort into making sure that people would think of Asgard in a new way, and then he gets annoyed that people are thinking about it in a different way. I feel confused about the direction that he was trying to take this in, because he did improve Asgard so much, and yet he just can't seem to stomach the fact that he did that. I feel like it would have been way more significant for Loki and Thor's characters and the Asgardians if they then had to live on Asgard knowing where it came from. And it also raises the question of, well, how did Odin hide that? Because surely the other realms remember, it's not like this was a billion years ago, like this is within most recent Asgardian history. So it just raises a lot of like world building questions, but rather than answering any of these questions, Watiti blew up Asgard so he wouldn't have to, which is a little bit lazy and it annoys me because I'm like, bro, do you know the amount of rich gold that you just dug up for us as far as like the culture and the history of Asgard goes? I have never seen anyone who complains about Ragnarok complain about the fact that Watiti changed Asgard's history because everyone loves what he did to Asgard because it improved Asgard so much. I love, love, love what he did to Asgard and how he improved it. I just wish that we had gotten the time to sit with it. Why would you do that? It annoys me. I feel sad. I wish that he'd kept it. I think the reason that this happened is because Watiti is also way, way too focused on just trying to make the story funny because that's the most interesting part to him, I guess, which is fair because he can explore the story however he wants to. This is his story, but I wish that he had done something else. I wish that he had cared a little bit more about what he had done to Asgard and actually thought about how that would affect Thor and Loki. I don't know. It's a wasted opportunity. Speaking of wasted opportunities, uh, Watiti is also way, 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 way too focused on trying to make this dark story, which Ragnarok is very dark, very funny. He doesn't want you to feel emotions. There's an alternative scene for Odin's death that takes place in New York, where Odin never got out of New York, and he ends up dying in an alley after getting stabbed by Hela. This scene is actually really good, like I look this scene up on YouTube sometimes and just watch it because it's that good. Thor and Loki's reactions are much more believable, and you feel something when you watch this, and yeah.
You weren't supposed to do that. Apparently on a test audience, Watiti was so dismayed that people felt sympathy for Odin that he had it refilmed so that way you'd feel more detached from it. This movie does not have any interest in letting you feel something. Watiti just wants to make you laugh. That's it. He doesn't care about furthering the character's journeys. He doesn't want to complete arcs. He has no interest in finishing a story that was loved for six years at that point. He just wanted you to look at the characters and laugh and laugh and laugh. And the most frustrating part about this to me is none of what I've just said. It's the fact that Watiti wants to take extremely serious mental health issues and make them the butt of jokes. As a heads up, this next section will be discussing suicide and how Takiyo Watiti handled that extremely poorly and with severe insensitivity. If suicide is something that is a trigger for you, I'm giving you a very big hug and here's a time skip. Please stay as safe as possible. You are worth it and I love you and one more hug just for the road. Listening to him describe Bruce as bipolar with cruelly negative connotations makes me feel slimy inside and I don't like it. Hulk is a manifestation of the abuse that Bruce suffered as a child from the hands of his father and the duo would be much better handled if we stopped thinking of them as bipolar which they are not, and something more akin to dissociative identity disorder, like Moon Knight. That's what Bruce was supposed to be. It makes me angry that Watiti did not bother to do basic character background to understand a character whose mental health struggles have been integral to his character in the comics and MCU. Bruce was never boring. He just didn't have time to have his story addressed on the level that Cap, Tony, and Thor got. He had one film that everyone forgot about, and I cannot stress enough just how well Bruce was handled in Avengers 1 and 2. That was Bruce. We got to see him at last. And then Ragnarok looked at everything that made Bruce who he is and decided, so the mental health problems of his characters just don't vibe with me. Let's just not do that. And then just to top it off, Watiti has Bruce commit suicide and then forces you to laugh at it. A character who is stated to have had a previous suicide attempt. Yeah, sure, he was doing it to force Hulk out and he was fine. Yeah, sure, it was funny to watch him go with a big splat. That does not take away what this scene actually was. Bruce jumped out of this ship with the intention to kill himself. Does that. Dies. And Watiti can only focus on how funny it is. Isn't this so great that his body distorted like this? Aren't you having a good time yet? Isn't it so funny to laugh at mental health struggles and make suicide into a joke? I'm having a great time. And it doesn't stop with Bruce. According to Watiti, he really wrestled the poor baby with between the big splat scene versus a different take on this where everyone would be lined up on the Bifrost bridge and then Hulk would punch Loki off the bridge to make fun of the first film. That was it. There was no deeper narrative behind that. There was no character moment that would make sense. Watiti wanted to make fun of Loki's suicide attempt at the end of the first film. This man really has a thing for making suicide funny, doesn't he? We're the only two characters on MCU that have had confirmed suicide attempts. As someone who has wrestled with suicidal thoughts and urges, this disgusts me on a level I cannot describe. It was 2017 when this movie was released. It wasn't 1950. You were actively making fun of mental health struggles because you want to get a laugh out of your audience and you knew what you were doing with TD. There is no way to fly over his head. I had to watch a character kill themselves on screen and you made fun of it. I had to watch a character whose suicide attempt broke him make fun of it in a one-liner that evidently replaced the Bifrost scene which mocks anyone who empathized with Loki's attempt on his own life. Screw you. Valkyrie's struggle with addiction? Funny, she's passing out. Goodness, isn't it just hilarious that her struggles with alcoholism are so intense that she can't function without it anymore? There's no way that that would indicate that she needs help and we should take this seriously for two seconds. Addiction is a funny joke now, just like people trying to off themselves obviously. I can ignore the character differences between the Dark World and Ragnarok. I can ignore the retcon and the costume designs and the stupid dialogue and the terrible jokes. I can embrace the tone and the comedy and this movie is funny and well written but this is a level of ignorance that I cannot abide by. This is what makes me hate this movie with my entire soul. It had nothing to do with the retcon because I don't care about the retcon. Yes, I'm angry they changed the story and the tone and turned it into a comedy, but the reason I hate it so much is because of the fact that all of these mental health problems are glossed over and turned into joke after joke because it's funny.
How dare you? I can't believe he was put in charge of this movie with characters that have such severe mental health problems. I cannot believe how little he cared for the characters and how much he turned their mental health problems into a joke. You know that scene where Thor and Hulk talk about their feelings after Thor wakes up? Yeah. That was put in as a joke. Because feelings are just funny and god forbid men have feelings and discuss them. What would we do? Society might die. What I find funny are things where Hulk and Thor would be sitting on, on a bed after having an argument and you know, talking about feelings. Because I've never seen that before uh, in a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. And I find that kind of thing hilarious because it's like how when you see how ridiculous these or over the top these characters are, and then have them talking about stuff that we all talk about, mm -hmm. you know, after we've had an argument. Um, that to me is like, that is hilarious to me. I am very angry. When I started working on this video, I had no intention of putting anything in about Watiti because I didn't think it was relevant to what was going on. But he is the reason all of this went on. He talks about actors not being funny like it's a cardinal sin. Contractually, we were forced to use them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so but would that make it a bit easier? Uh... Well, not everyone's funny. Um, but did he make it easy to put these jokes in knowing that they would get no. them? And this is bad, and I will die mad about it, but another thing Ragnarok just glosses over is grief. Odin dies in this film, Asgard is blown up, Thor's friends die, and Ragnarok does not allow any breathing room for this in the slightest, because Watiti doesn't care, because it won't make you laugh. The Warriors' three central characters to both movies' plots beforehand are brutally slaughtered by Hela and Thor never even asks about them. This would be equivalent to Pepper Rhodey and Happy being murdered in the opening scene of Iron Man 3 and Tony not giving a crap or asking what happened. The Warriors are a footnote, if that. These were Thor's best friends. What happened to Volstagg's family? Are you even aware that this is his daughter? Yeah, his daughter, because he has a family. The Warriors 3 were characters that had depth and rich backgrounds that should have been explored in more detail because there was so much to work with. Fandral defends Loki to Sif in the first film. Clearly they had some type of relationship. Let's talk about that. Hogan is from Vanaheim. Why is he on Asgard then? Sif is a woman in a man's position in a very patriarchal society and she's thriving. Let's talk more about her. Ah, my foot fell asleep and I'm dying. <laughs> Trying to take this seriously and ah! Look at me putting a funny joke in the middle of this very serious discussion. I'm turning into the very thing I hope to destroy. The Warriors 3 remain wasted opportunity that Watiti wants you to forget about immediately because he didn't like them. That's it. They were obliterated so you could focus on the important parts of the story. Having a good old laugh. The fact that Jane Foster is turned into a passing line is so insulting. You didn't like their love story? Okay. Just have Jane be busy then elsewhere. You know Thor has always been a love story, right? In the comics, in the animated versions, in the films. And the reason it works so well is because Jane and Thor can stand alone as characters and don't need each other to function. They both serve purposes to the plot that have nothing to do with their romance. Jane is a central character to the Thor franchise. Cutting her out just because you don't like it is insulting. And yeah, Natalie Portman was busy at the time, but that doesn't mean you have to break up their romance. Riga died for Jane. She's a huge part of why Loki and Thor are where they are now. And another truly mind-boggling thing about all of this is that Thor 4 is regarded as one of the worst films in MCU because it's funny and never has any breathing room. But Ragnarok is exactly the same way. They are the same movie, you guys. Nothing changed. Thor 4 has no idea how to do subtext anymore and uses goats as comedy. But the format, the tone, the pacing, Thor 4 is the same as Ragnarok. But the spell has been broken? It didn't start here, guys. I, I don't know. I'm angry, obviously, and shouting won't fix anything. But I guess I just want to say this before I shut up. Guardians of the Galaxy was one of the best trilogies in MCU because it understood itself. It was directed by a director who loved the characters and wanted to see them stretched and ripped open and made better. James Gunn loves the Guardians, and you can feel that with every scene. He wanted to finish their story. Guardians of the Galaxy is a comedy, but it knows when to take itself seriously and when to have some breathing room. Ragnarok doesn't. Guardians 3 made choices that made sense for the characters, not ones that were convenient to the plot. Like Gamora and Peter, it picked up the story where we left off in Endgame and Guardians 2. It didn't reinvent itself, it built on what was there. And when you get to the end of Guardians of the Galaxies 3, you feel like you went through a whole journey. 
Guardians of the Galaxy 3 even makes a point to let you know you've become part of the family by having you understand Groot at the end. The thing about Guardians 3 that makes it so different from Thor 3 is that Guardians truly cared about what came before. It took the mental health problem seriously, it knew when to stop being funny, and when to give you some breathing room. I know I've said that like four times, but I cannot stress that enough. It didn't make you laugh at situations that weren't funny. If someone had attempted to kill themselves in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, you can bet your life savings that James Gunn would have handled that eons better than Watiti did. Peter's alcoholism is treated seriously. The abuse that Nebula and Gamora went through from Thanos and how that traumatized them is given a whole arc in the second and carries on in the third one. Rocket's PTSD is treated seriously. Drax is comedic relief, yes, but God knows where he was going with Drax and makes sure to give him an ending that makes sense for what Drax needs. Mantis is given a huge arc. Thor 3 doesn't do that. It's drowning in its clown shoes. The difference is also perfectly summarized by this quote, which by the way, if you're wondering why all of the names have been blocked out, I have been harassed relentlessly on Tumblr for not liking Ragnarok, so I thought I'd spare some grief for all these people and also block out their names. It's not that I don't want to give credit, it's just that I don't want people to kill them. Quote by unknown YouTuber, something I just realized now. There's a fundamental difference between how Takiya Watiti and James Gunn write their films. Watiti takes things that you're supposed to care about and makes you laugh at them, and Gunn takes things you're supposed to laugh at and makes you care about them. So yeah, I'm angry. I will probably die angry about this movie. Ragnarok sucks as a sequel because the director didn't want to make a sequel even though it was supposed to be a sequel, and it easily could have been a sequel that worked. Hey. Here's an idea that would have been really simple to both fix Thor 2 retroactively and keep the plot of Thor 3 mostly the same. Yeah, so how is Thor's half-sister, right? What if Malekith killed her mom in retaliation for Odin's father killing his wife and Odin did nothing to stop it? And child Hela had to watch and that's why she hates him so much and she's trying to save the universe from Malekith without realizing he's already dead? I don't know, it's not that hard. Everyone says that Malekith is detached from the narrative, so attach him, you idiots. Also, while I'm here ruining your fun and this movie, how about I explain to you the biggest plot hole in this entire film that I noticed in theaters and was unable to take this film seriously afterwards? So Hela spends the entire movie trying to get Heimdall's sword. It's like her thing, she needs it in order to conquer the universe. The whole plot revolves around Heimdall's sword. But does it have to? Because Gunganir, Odin's staff, also opens the Bifrost, and Hela has it with her for the majority of the film. You can see her sitting with it right here. Well, oopsie, I guess the plot of the film could have been solved in like, maybe a minute. And again, to reiterate this, taking mental health struggles and turning them into jokes is extremely insensitive. It's not funny, especially with something as serious and life-threatening as suicide and something as life-destroying as addiction. All of my frustrations with Watiti's directing revolve around this point. If he had just taken the mental health struggles he decided to put into this movie seriously, then I also think that Ragnarok would be one of the best movies ever made. Maybe not one of the best sequels, because there are still significant character moves that needed to happen but didn't, but it would have been one of the best movies. A lot of the problems in this film circle around the fact that the writers and Watiti didn't want to take these mental health problems seriously. Characters devolved because no one could take their mental health problems seriously. Like, I know I've said that 500 times, but I really can't emphasize that enough. Please give some breathing room for problems like this in your story rather than glossing over it or turning it into jokes. It is harmful and it does affect people. I have to skip over scenes in this movie and I'm sure that other people have to avoid it like the plague because there are just so many harmful messages that are given in this movie and because everyone says that this is the best movie of all time, we don't discuss that. But no, Ragnarok is one of the most insensitive movies to mental health I have ever seen. It's not that you can't put things like this in your story, but if you're going to, please, please understand the weight of it and put effort into making sure that you handle it in a sensitive way. <sighs> I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. I hate this movie, I think. So obviously this means I'm going to rewatch what I can of it again for Hella because she's the only good part in retrospect honesty hours of 1.23 a.m. I think I might have a tiny crush on her. Also, Korg is the worst character I've ever seen and I loathe him. He is so annoying. I hope he dies. He's not a replacement for the Warriors and he can barely justify his existence in the plot.